This webinar series is presented by the South Carolina Research Authority and the Kim and Leahy Law Firm. Today we will learn about the benefits of patent searching, how to build a search strategy, and how to perform better prior art search. Today's presentation is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all registered attendees. Please type any questions into the Q&A chat box. I'm joined today by my friend, Doug Kim. Doug is a physicist, an expert diver, and an attorney at the Kim and Leahy Law Firm. Thanks for joining us today, Doug. Leigh, well, thanks so much. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> well, I. Before we get this started, I want to thank SCRA for putting on this webinar, as well as the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This is one of those um, public services that I think are invaluable uh, to the public in general. Um, personally, my ex my involvement with the uh, my involvement with the SCRA actually began almost 20 years ago when SC Launch was first kicked off, and I've been you know enjoyed working with that organization for a long time. And very pleased to see that SCRA and the USPTO are combining to provide this seminar. Um, today's topic is about patent searching, which, real briefly, there's really several types of searches. There's a patent search about freedom to operate, what's out there in the world and are allowed you to use your invention and do you have any issues with infringement. Another one is state of the art. State of the art searching are things that are what's the current level of technology, and you can decide where you fit into that. Then we get into some things called invalidity searching and you know, validity searching, how strong is your patent or not. But today we're not talking about any of those. Cynthia from the United States Patent and Trademark Office is gonna to talk to us about prior art search. Some of the benefits of prior art searching, which is, um, you know, we it's, it's optional, but it's recommended before you go into a patent application process. But some of the benefits that you get from this are that you find out what else is out there, who else has tried to patent something like this is similar. When you get the results back, particularly from a novelty search, you can find out, well, gosh, there's nothing out there like this. I may be onto something here. You can also go the other way and find out, well, wow, there's a patent or a patent application that's very similar to what I'm trying to do. If you find that situation, it's not a showstopper. What I've suggested for years is, okay, if there's somebody out there who's already come up with this idea, call them. Let's figure out who they are. Let's figure out why we don't see this product on the marketplace. We also find out that patent searching, when we have the results before we file an application, which we'll get to in the next part of this series, it actually helps us draft better patent claims because we know what we're dealing with. So with that said, we're going to turn this over to Cynthia and let her explain to us exactly what this the novelty um, patentability search is from the perspective of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Cynthia? Thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. So um, I'm going to be going through a series of slides. And as Doug uh, has mentioned, it's going to be talking about doing patent searching and what do you need to be considering when you're doing um, a search to see what's out there. So um, in, do, in doing this presentation, I'm going to be talking about what kind of searching you can do, the uh, tips and tricks for doing that searching, and also provide an example of a six-step process that we suggest may help you to make sure that you're comprehensive when you're conducting your search. All right, so um, obviously we're going to be talking about why to search. Doug has mentioned a little, a few examples of why to search, but we're going to be explaining why do you want to search? You really want to know what's out there. You know, as Doug said, it could be so novel that it never doesn't exist at all, or it could be such a crowded space that there's a lot out there. And how does your invention fit into what is out there and knowing how you're going to write your um, application so that you are identifying what you're trying to invent. Conducting a search can be, you know, keyword, 
meaning, you know, I'm going to be search, I'm going to be conducting um, a search about um, pens, and so I'm going to be talking about, you know, writing implements and things like that. Um, and we're going to suggest also that in addition to doing what we call that the keyword or text searching, is you also do a classification searching. And it might be Cindy, I don't know anything about classification. And I'm going to talk about it and show you where you can be learning as you're searching. The classification system that I'm going to be focusing on today is called the Cooperative Patent Classification or referred to as CPC. Um, this is a classification system that the Patent Office has been using since 2015, and I'll talk more about that. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to give you an illustration of, of the six step process and how you can use that in uh, conducting your searching. And um, in doing so, what you want to do is to have a search strategy so that you can determine um, what's out there and is your invention new and novel and non obvious. So any kind of um, patents or information that is referenced on these slides is just for illustrative purposes and we're not endorsing any of these uh, patents or patent applications or any of that information. Okay, so what is a patent? So a patent, um, is, and I'm going to be specifying and focusing on a U.S. patent. Okay, so a U.S. patent is, is you are wanting to have property rights granted within the United States. Okay, and it's going to exclude others from making, using, offering, selling um, that invention throughout the United States, um, as well as importing the invention into the United States. And um, this protection is for a limited amount of time. And in, in, in um, submitting your patent application, you are also then um, identifying that you're going to publicly disclose what you're trying to invent. Okay, so why search? So um, Doug mentioned a little bit um, is that you want to find out, is your idea, it has to be new, useful, non-obvious. So what is that? Are you um, Are sharing you? your slides, Cindy? I thought I was. Uh, we don't see them. Okay. Um, I was sharing. Was, let me go back and see what happened to my sharing. Thank you very much, Sue. All righty. All righty. Um, let me just kind of go back to... Um, to what is a patent. Can you see this now? Yes. Yeah, that's great, okay. thanks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Let me, thank you for letting me know, Sue. Okay, so um, what I wanna talk about just is the definition of what is a patent. Um, you know, it's, it's protection with the United States for a limited amount of time um, and it's excluding others from making, using, offering, et cetera, okay? Um, and so um, why to search? So um, why to search is that you need to find out is your invention new, useful, and non-obvious. An example of non-obvious is I want to invent a pen um, and I want my pen to uh, perhaps glow in the dark. Um, and um, is that, you know, has that been sort of done before or a version of that's been done before? Um, and so perhaps if it has, perhaps there's ink out there that can glow in the dark. So maybe um, even though, you know, I think this is a great invention, um, maybe it's obvious that you could just convert something and make that ink um, glow in the dark. All right, so, you know, we need to determine, you know, is something out there and is my idea new? useful and not obvious, okay? So what we're gonna be determining is how do you know if your invention is new and not obvious? And that's where you wanna search. What is out there? All right, so um, in um, submitting a patent applications, there's many steps, all right? And so the steps we're gonna be focusing on today is determining if your invention is patentable. And that is by conducting a search. All right, so um, what you wanna do is um, in determining is your um, invention indeed you know, novel and non-obvious, you're gonna be conducting a search, all right? And um, we're gonna be focusing today on searching US patents and published patent applications. 
a U.S. patent application is published 18 months after filing, unless the applicant says, no, do not publish, okay? But U.S. patents are, um, are published, um, you know, um, on Tuesdays, if it's every Tuesday or every other Tuesday, but they're, they're um, provided to the public very frequently. All right, so um, we talked about that you're going to be doing a keyword search, and I know you will, and I'm not going to stop you from doing that, but you need to determine that there are some, might be some fit pitfalls when you are um, doing a keyword search. And that's why we encourage you also to consider doing a classification search in addition to keyword. And I'll be talking about that in a minute. Okay, so what is prior art? So before I started working for the patent office, to me, prior art would have been a Mona Lisa or some kind of painting or sculpture. And so the terminology here in the patent office is any kind of documentation that discusses or describes um, the information about a, um, an invention. And so what I want to do as, a, as an applicant is I want to find out is anything out there and if so, what it is and how does that perhaps um, differ from what I am trying to do or how does what I'm trying to invent different from what already exists in the public. All right. And so, um, and then also it's a duty of the applicant so that when you're submitting your application to submit, you know, what have you found that's out there and how is your um, invention um, different from what is already existing. Um, in doing so, when you're submitting your application, you may find that the patent examiner, you know, may reject some of the claims of, of what you're claiming, um, but perhaps by working with the examiner, you can um, determine what aspect of your invention can be patented, if it can be patented. Um, but again, they're going to be looking for, um, is this non-obvious besides new and novel? Okay, so what can be prior art? So as I mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on today US patents and patent applications that have been published. But you may also wanna consider looking at foreign patents and published foreign patent applications in journals and magazine articles. Have you been to a um, convention or presented at a conference? So perhaps a conference proceedings, obviously websites are big out there right now, any kind of thing in books and journals, scientific papers. So any information that's disclosed to the public can be considered prior art. And what you're looking for in that prior art is a date, when was this um, made public? All right, so let's talk about keyword searching. All right, so um, talking about vague or inconsistent. So if you're trying to invent a toy, um, that you know, toy. What's a toy? Um, my uh, nephew just turned two um, this past month, and if I said to him, "What do you want for a toy?" or he's not going to say, you know, and Cindy, I want a toy. What he's going to say is, "I want a truck. I want a dump truck." You know, he's going to be very specific. So when you're doing your search, you don't want to be perhaps too broad in your term, but be specific. What are you looking for? Um, also, there could be terms that are obsolete, you know, um, LP, you know, long playing record, hi-fi, um, you know, how often do you say, okay, excuse me, I need to go to the water closet, um, you know, so, but there may be terms that are out there that you need to be aware of. How do I know those terms are out there and what I'm aware of? As you are conducting your search, you know, make a note or a list of the terminology that you're finding out there to know, use that as part of my keyword, number one. Number two, as you're explaining your idea to perhaps a friend or a colleague, um, uh, you know, or family member, what terms do you use to explain um, what you're trying to invent? And perhaps as they ask questions to clarify, what terms are you using to clarify what you're trying to accomplish? Or perhaps the terms they use in trying to say, well, are you trying to invent something that goes in the water closet? So, you know, just kind of listen to what people are saying to you and what you're saying to people. Um, if you're working with a mouse and trying to invent something about a mouse, and my mother, rest in peace, um, was not computer savvy. And so if I said to her, hi, mom, I'm going to buy a mouse. She'd be thinking, why do you want to buy a rodent? You know, you've got two cats. That's going to, you know, be fun for that mouse. And it's like, no, 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 mom, I'm going to buy a computer mouse. All right. So you need to be determining, you know, what is the terms you're using? 
And I have a, um, a personal example of the word terminal. My background is computer science, and um, I was working for a consulting firm in, in my past. And the uh, consulting firm is talking about that um, the, uh, our customer is going to be doing something called terminal consolidation. Well, of course I knew what that meant. My background is computer science. At the time, a terminal was a computer monitor. And what they wanted to do was to put a bunch of functionality together on the same computer terminal. I knew what that meant and I was fine. Um, and then we meet the customer and my customer is the FAA. And to them, a terminal is that huge building that you run through to try to catch your plane. So it's like, oh, so now the terminal is not a computer terminal. Now we're talking about a building. Um, and another prior job that I had, I worked for the Medical University of South Carolina. People talking about South Carolina, um, wonderful state, um, wonderful city of Charleston, beautiful. Um, and um, in doing so, uh, we were setting up um, a lab where the uh, medical students could come in and take practice boards. And so it was like, what do we label this lab? Terminal room, terminal lab. Um, remember, I'm here at the Medical University of South Carolina at this time. And we were on the fourth floor of the building and the seventh floor of the building was a cadaver lab. And so it's like, if we label this terminal lab, well, we have corpses being rolled in. So again, now we've got terminal having to do with medicine. Okay, last but not least, a friend of mine owned a repair shop. And if I talk to him, a car repair shop, and if I talk to him about a terminal, to him, that's a battery. You know, so again, I've got terminal, in my opinion, was computers. Then it was a building. Then it was medical. Then it has to do with car repair. So now when I'm talking terminal, I've got to be specific. What is terminal meaning? Okay. So be aware. That's one of the pitfalls of using a, a, a text is you say something and somebody else may interpret as something else. Um, and then if we're going to be talking about a computer or are we talking about a animal mouse, then we're gonna also maybe have synonyms. So we talk about mouse, a synonym can be rodent. So again, think about what are synonyms for the terminology that in your keywords. All right, um, who is submitting the patent applications? You know, have they come from a, a country that spells a little different than, than we do? So of course, this is how we spell color. But if you have been to England or perhaps even in Canada, you may find color spelled a different way. So when you're doing a search, you maybe want to be cognizant of alternate spellings. You know, we got the word tire and tire is another example. All right. Um, and then we have talking about, you know, spelling errors that, you know, we're not perfect, you know, so that somebody may we spell repellent A and T or versus E and T. In a three-wheeled um, bicycle, um, you know, I don't call it a three-wheeled bicycle. Talking to my, uh, my nephew, it would be a tricycle. You know, I want a tricycle in Cindy for my birthday. Um, and so not only could it be three-wheeled or tri-biked, uh, wheeled, it could be the number three, you know, so be a cognizant of, okay, how, what's the variations of that keyword that I'm trying to enter? If you use any kind of acronyms, not only use the acronyms, but spell it out, LED, light emitting diode, and how many people even know that LED stands for light emitting diode? Probably not a lot, but if you're using acronyms, make sure that you also spell them out as well. All right, so some of the biggest challenging, not only getting the right terminology and, and perhaps the synonyms for this right terminology, is that um, there's a limit of how far back you can go in history um, for patents. Um, uh, and so Google Patents um, goes back only, only back as 1880. And you think, well, Cindy, that's pretty old, 1880. Um, but depending on what you're trying to invent, you know, is it an engine, is it improving an engine part or whatever, you know, so, the, you know, the art that you may be looking for may go back 1880 or even earlier. Um, the patent office was um, opened in 1790. So between 1719 and 1880, we're talking 90 years there. Um, if you go to, um, you can also be searching off the USPTO um, public website. And in doing so, if you use the public website, 
on that software only allows you to do text searching back to 1976, which in my opinion is not very old. Okay, and then the um, the examiners at the patent office use a um, software called East or West Examiner Automated Search Tool or a web-based um, search tool, and that's the, the software that they use to to find prior art. Um, there is a public version of East and of West um, that the public can use by um, going to certain um, computer terminals, and those computer terminals are at um, the uh, patent office locations, um, as well as certain libraries and universities throughout the United States. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but that text searching, again, only takes you to 1971. Again, in my opinion, that's not very old. Um, and so how do I get to, if I need to get to, you know, um, patents and patent applications that are older than these dates, is why we're suggesting to also include classification searching. So let me talk about that. So classification, you are all familiar with the classification system. You go to the library and there's a Dewey Decimal System. And when you go to a library, you don't say to the librarian, you know, I'm looking for a book on travel. And the librarian says, oh, yeah, go to the back, go, go behind me in the room. And there's just stacks and stacks of books all over and, you know, kind of fumble through until you find you know, the, the uh, book you're looking for. Or you go to a bookstore, it's all organized. We got history, we got travel, we got fiction, we got nonfiction. So you're familiar with the classification system. And so the patent office does the same thing that they classify um, the patents and the patent applications. So there's been several classification systems that have existed um, up until 2015. The U.S. had the United States Patent Classification System, and when the U.S. Um, class, when the examiner classified um, a uh, a patent, um, they would identify the classification of where that patent um, should um, be associated. And there can be more than one value uh, in classification on a patent, and we'll see that shortly. There is also an international IPC, International Patent Classification System, and that still exists today. All right, and then the European Patent Office had ECLA, the European Classification System, um, and that um, was in effect until 2013. All right, and then the um, Japanese have their FI system. But I've talked about CPC, that Cooperative Patent Classification System, and that classification system is a marriage between the US classification and the European Patent Office classification. Um, and as I mentioned, this started to be rolled out in um, 2015 um, to be used um, in classifying US um, patents. So um, we'll talk more about that and that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, you'll see that the format of a CPC value is based off the format of a uh, international patent classification format. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So that's what is now the US is using to classify as well as the European Patent Office is now using the CPCs for classification. Um, the US has taken and applied CPC values to all patents that have been issued. So even though we're starting to use it in the US since 2015, the US has retrofitted and gone back to um, patents um, you know, that um, have existed and obviously prior to 2015 and has added CPC values and I'll show you how that works. Okay, so we've got the CPC that we're talking about partnership with the European Patent Office. And um, I talked about that it's going to be using a format from the international classification. And the very high level um, in that format is a letter. And it's going to be anywhere from A to H. So if you're talking about a um, invention that has to do with human necessities, then the high level would be an A. You know, if you're doing something um, in, um, you know, chemistry or, or some kind of metallurgy, kind of metallurgy, metallurgy um, um, aspect, and that would be a C, you know, and D, et cetera. So think about where is your invention falling broadly, all right? 
All right, so we're going to talk about the six step process and, and give you an illustration. And this is not a sacred you know, six step process, but we feel like this provides you a comprehensive way to approach. And so this, um, this six step process, again, we're going to apply to US patents and patent applications because we want to find out what is out there that we pre preclude um, our invention from being on um, 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 issued, um, or do we need to focus what we're claiming so that we can um, be different than what's already out there? Um, and then once you get past doing searching in the U.S. patents and uh, patent applications, you may also want to broaden, as I mentioned, to do foreign patent searching as well as non-patent literature. And you know, we talked about non-patent literature being anything that's not a patent. You know, so we talked about journal articles on conference proceedings, on you know, websites, et cetera. All right. And one of the things you want to be very diligent on recording what you have searched, when you did the search, what did you find in your results? So you want to keep a very um, concise and comprehensive record of what you found. And you may um, be repeating. I don't think you're going to be a once type search and be done because you may find that you need to add more terms. You may come up with new synonyms kinds of things. And so you probably will do be doing several iterations of searching. Okay, so our example is going to be that we're going to be inventing an umbrella. And the umbrella is such that it doesn't um, turn inside out when the wind's blowing or it doesn't collapse, you know, when we've got some inclement weather. Um, and, uh, and, and my niece um, graduated from high school and um, was a uh, valedictorian of her class, which I'll be very proud of. And I was helping her, helping her um, out of the car and into the school when of course it started to pour rain. And as I, in, in being nervous and excited, as I opened up the umbrella, it turned inside out. And so I'm protecting her and now I'm collecting water and she's getting wet. So she would have loved to have an umbrella that did not turn inside out. So what we need to do is step one, we need to brainstorm what terms are we going to be using. So what is the purpose of the invention? Is it a utilitarian invention, meaning does it have a purpose? You know, um, or is it just a design ornamental? So if you've got any kind of stitching, perhaps, you know, on what you're wearing today, if it's just stitching, you know, to make it look interesting, it doesn't have a purpose, then that's going to be an ornamental kind of design, and that would be an ornamental a patent application. But if that design or if that, if that um, uh, stitching that you have um, is also reflects um, light at night, so that if you're running or biking or even walking, that you know, you're, you're being able to be seen at night, <coughs> then um, then that would be a utilitarian type of application because it has a purpose, it has a function, okay? Um, what is the um, invention? What are you inventing? Are you inventing how it's being made, what is being made, or just the product itself? So you need to determine that. Um, what is the invention made of? Um, what is the structure of the invention? So I know that if I invent an umbrella made of concrete, it is not gonna turn inside out. I may not be able to lift it, but so maybe that's not quite the right approach to take. To take, but you know, so you determine perhaps you know is that important of what the invention is made of, and that's what are you trying to invent, and how will this invention be used, especially if it's utilitarian? All right, so now you've got to come up, and this is to me part of the hard part. What are the key words and terms you're going to use to describe your invention? Again, talking to people, perhaps you can solve a dictionary, a thesaurus to come up with synonyms. Okay, so, so in our example, step one, what's the purpose? We got an umbrella for a new rib design so that we don't collapse or turn inside out. Um, we are inventing an improvement to invent umbrellas so you don't have to buy a lot, more inventions or umbrellas. Um, and, and what are we having to have as part of our um, invention? You know, perhaps it's the rib design, the stretchers, maybe the fabric that we're using or, or anything along that line. So we need to include that perhaps in our application. And then why is an exam or why is an applicant or, or the public want to use your uh, invention, you know, for uh, 
um, for an umbrella, you're either protecting yourself from the rain or um, you're protecting your house perhaps against the sun. So what are some terms about umbrella? All right, so here somebody's talking about parasol, um, a sunshade, um, I was thinking bumper shoot. Um, if you have ever been, you know, in England, you know, they may use the term bumper shoot. So maybe that's gonna be one of my synonyms. And then um, we're also talking about being windproof and wind resistant. So, you know, are there some other terms that we might want to think of between windproof and wind resistant, but those would be our synonyms. So we've got basically two concepts, the umbrella being the apparatus, and then we, work, we need to make it windproof. So step number two is we've, we've started developing our keywords um, and synonyms. Now, how do we want to bring those keywords and synonyms together? So if we um, are um, coordinating our synonyms, we're going to or those together. So it would be umbrella or parasol or sunshade or bumper shoot. So they, those are the ors. And then when we've got, you know, and then for wind resistant and windproof, it would be windproof or wind resistant. Now we've got those two concepts and those two concepts we're gonna to add together. You may wanna do wild cards um, in your terminology because we're talking about umbrella or umbrellas, plural. All right, so we can talk about how do we do um, identify the fact that we're looking not only for singular, but plural versions of a term, or perhaps ing, you know, windproofing, you know, besides windproof. So we'll see how we incorporate wildcards in there. And then if it has to be a phrase, you may want to put that in quote marks. All right. And as you're doing your searching and you become more uh, cognizant of what's out in the, in the public already, is who's your competitor? You know, whether it's a company or perhaps the inventor name. So you also may want to do a search based on inventor name to see, you know, what else has that inventor done to be able to see, you know, if, are, they, are they getting close to what I've been trying to do or invent? All right, so here's an example. We've got umbrella with the asterisk, so we can get the singular and plural, you know, parasol, you know, sunshade, and then we've got windproof or wind resistant. Um, you know, it could be maybe we should do windproof um, asterisk, so we might want to get windproofing, windproofed, you know, in addition. So you may want to perhaps put an asterisk after that, you know, and we've got wind resistant as two words. I don't know, has it ever been spelled as one word? You know, perhaps, but we've got the um, quote marks around to be able to get a phrase. So here's an example of a query. Okay, step number three is now you've got your, your keywords and your query built. Now you want to conduct that searching. So as I mentioned before, you conduct that searching, record what have you found? What are you finding? Perhaps you're finding additional um, keywords or synonyms that you might want to be including in further searching. Um, you, um, do you want to focus on is your um, invention a very visible kind of invention? So by looking at drawings will help you determine whether the documents you're looking at apply to what you're trying to invent. Um, if it's software, then one flow chart looks like another. Um, you know, you want to maybe focus on the terminology and the claims. All right. So as you're doing your searching, you know, what are you looking for? What are you finding? All right. And then once you um, find your area of where your information or your um, application is, is um, relevant, then you may wanna look at what did that, that patent or patent application that I'm looking for, um, where, you know, what um, prior art did they, did they find? And one of the things that I think about in searching is um, I think about kind of is fishing. You know, so you go fishing, you got your, 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 um, your rod and your reel and, and you've got your fishing tackle and all of that. And you, you know, walk out to the, to the river or to the lake or whatever, and you start casting out and you don't get any bites, you know, and it's like, do you go home for the day? I've got to have dinner. I, this is what we were going to have for dinner was fish. So it's like, you know, so when searching, if you put in keywords and combine them and not finding, you know, your art area, you know, maybe you're, you're not fishing in the right fishing hole. You maybe you have to perhaps then, you know, move, you know, your, your fishing spot to, you know, another place on the river or you're in a boat and go to another place on the lake. Um, and, you know, now when you throw in, you know, in cast, 
Now you're getting a bite, you're getting the right fish, you're getting the fish that are the right size, etc. So when you're getting into what I call that sweet spot, then you may want to say, okay, what are other documentation that was cited by that patent, perhaps to, to go down that direction as well. All right, so obviously you're going to record on um, what patents you find. And again, this is probably going to be not a one-time search, but you might want to repeat and refine. So here's an example, and I'm going to make this a little bit larger. I mentioned before that 2015 is when the U.S. started using those CPC values in classifying patents that are issued. All right, so let me make this uh, a little bigger so you can see it. All right, so um, this is, um, well, let me go back one here. Hold on, I think I, um, let me go back one slide. Okay, um, and so, um, go back, sorry. And so we're looking at um, 2015. Um, this patent was issued in 2017. Obviously that's after 2015. So let me come in a little bit closer and notice we've got CPC values. So we've got A, 45B, space, 19, forward slash, 200. These are dates of when that CPC value was created, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, so here we've got three CPC values of where this patent was classified. Um, and notice that, you know, and they're all with A for, you know, necessities. And then um, it doesn't always have to be, you know, the same uh, 45B, but here it is. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention, you see the spaces, all right, so if you're gonna be doing a CPC search, there should be no spaces between this B and 19 or this B and 23 or this B and 25. So a CPC value is A45 B 19 forward slash 00 or A45 B 23 forward slash 00. So this whole value should have no spaces in them when you're conducting a search, all right? All right, so now we're looking at a patent that was issued before 2015, and here is 2014, all right? And if I zoom in on the image, all right, um, I'm not seeing any CPC values at all. I'm seeing the US classification value, and that format was a class 135 subclass in this example 31. But Cindy, I'm not seeing any CPC values. So how can I search if I'm not seeing any CPC values on any patent images before 2015? And there's probably a lot of patents that were issued pr prior to 2015. Okay. So so we're looking at here at these uh, US patent 8783275. So what we wanna be looking at is the text that's behind that image. So the image is a picture of the words, but when you're doing a search, you're doing a search against the words that are behind that image. And in, in those words behind that image, um, is in a database. And so I told you that the US did retrofit CPC values to patents that were issued before 2015. So if I look at the text version um, of, of this um, patent, here we've got the US value that we talked about, 135 forwards class, some class, subclass 31, but now we're seeing the CPC values. All right, and so now we've got that A45, B25 in this example forward slash 22. Again, there'd be no spaces if you were gonna be doing this, you know, putting this value in for a search. It would be A45, B25 forward slash 22. All right, so if they retrofitted, they didn't republish the image, but in the database that's behind that image is where you'll find those CPC values. And so it's like, okay, Cindy, I don't know anything about CPC values. I don't know which ones to use. My point will be is as you're finding the art that's in that sweet spot, that's in that fishing hole, make a note of what are the CPC values on that particular patent that you're looking at. And, and, and record that, make a note of what those CPC values are. And then those are the CPC values that I would use in doing your search when you want to add classification to your searching. Um, the other point that I wanna make is, um, as I talked about, if you do text searching, you can only go far back as certain dates. It's 1880 in Google patents 
and then 1970s um, and on the US um, uh, public website or the, the public east and public west. Um, and so if you want to be able to get any kind of patents that were issued earlier than any of those dates, then just do a CPC value only. Do not add tax. So don't do a 45B 25 slash 22 dot CPC dot and umbrella. Because of doing so by adding and umbrella, that tax now limits you to how far you back you can go. So just do a, in this example, a 45B 25 forward slash 22 dot CPC with no text. Okay, so um, so then so we we did keyword. We talked about classification. We talked about looking at CPC values. Um, oh, I feel like I skipped over, but I guess I didn't. Okay, step number four is having to do with if you want to look up what are certain CPC values and what they mean. Okay, here we're on the USPTO.gov website, um, and we're going to click on under quick links. We can click on the a system um, that we're using um, in the patent office. And what we can do is type in the A45B254 slash 22. We're gonna be looking in CPC values, okay? And, um, and so, um, and so therefore you can look up and see what that is, okay? All right, and then step number five is um, I talked about you're in that sweet spot. Now, if I look at this particular um, patent and say this is a patent that um, is 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 in my area and you know and honing in on what is um, art art that's out there, um, what you might want to do is let me scroll is look we call references cited. So here's a front of a patent, happened to be issued in 2014, but it doesn't make any difference. Um, and this is all that prior art that both you as an applicant and the examiner has cited um, in examining the application and then eventually issuing it. And if you see any numbers that have an asterisk after them, these are the uh, prior art that the examiner found and then the others are what the applicant found in doing their search. So this is called, we're gonna be talking about what's called citation searching. I'm in my sweet spot. This is the um, application um, you know, area. I'm finding um, the patent that is in my area. Then you may wanna see, okay, what was cited by this um, patent? Perhaps that will help me hone in another way to dive in to finding um, prior art. All right, and then last but not least, step number six is broaden your search. We've been focusing on US patent and patent applications. You may wanna be looking at foreign patents. You may um, wanna be, and you can do that. One of the um, links that we have here provided to you is called eSpaceNet, which is the European Patent Office on um, being able to search there. We talked about non-patent literature, you know, between books and journals and, and um, conference proceedings, websites, et cetera. That's examples of the non. And then do you wanna be continuing to do this search on your own? We call that a pro se. Or would you like to go ahead and hire um, a, a patent office um, or agent to help you with either doing your search or helping you submit your patent application? We have a sponsor today. It's an example of a patent agent that could be available to provide you, you know, the guidance that, that you need, okay? So it's not required to have a patent agent, but depending on, you know, the sophistication and what you're trying to accomplish, you may wanna have that guidance of professionals to help you um, go through searching to make sure that your invention is useful, new, novel, not obvious, um, and also handhold you as you submit your patent application. All right, so we talked about looking at the CPC values. Um, you can go to the USPTO.gov website. I'll show you, you know, we can search on CPC values to find out you know, what are CPC values so you can learn more about them besides recording what you find and those documents that you retrieve that are relevant to your area. Um, and, and, and so we're able to do that kind of searching, okay? 
So you're on the USPTO.gov website. Um, I'm going to type in, it's just an example, CPC schema umbrella, either up in the right-hand corner or I'm looking for a CPC schema umbrella. And, um, and then when you get the results back through this website, um, I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can read it. Okay, so we had that A45B, all right, so it's walking sticks. I wouldn't think of that with an umbrella, but apparently so. Um, and so we click on that link and now we're into the CPC classification layout. Um, we've got A45B. All right, and now we want to scroll down because we were doing A45B, um, 254 slash, et cetera. All right. So here's that A45B, 254 slash 22. We scroll down. We would find this as a device by increasing the resistance of, of umbrellas to wind. Ah, that sounds exactly what we're looking for. Um, and so we want to find out what else is out there so that we can figure out how ours is new, novel, and non obvious. All right. So that would be that's a good uh, classification value that I would like to use for doing a classification search. If in the classification value prior to it, you find a D, okay, for definition, okay, so some don't have Ds. This one has a D in this example. All right, so if I click on the D, then it perhaps gives me more information. Here's an example, it's giving me a picture um, of what this classification is about. Um, and, and perhaps providing me, you know, is this, you know, we're looking perhaps at rib design, is this, a, you know, um, uh, influencing a web design and may influence how I write my application. Okay, so there are lots of other sources that we talked about, Google Patents, the European um, Office SpaceNet patent scope, you know, looking for CPC searching. Um, we talked about um, that you can go to the USPTO.gov website to do searching or go to a patent office, Alexandria, Detroit, Dallas, Denver, um, and San Jose are where um, the patent office are located. But right now, because of the pandemic, they are closed to the public right now. But when they do open, you could go there or you could go to something they call PTRC, Patent Trademark Resource Center. And those can be in libraries. Um, they can be um, at college uh, library. And I'll show you those in a minute. But um, these PTRCs will have computer terminals that will allow you to access Public East or Public West. Public East and Public West are proprietary software, so it's not something that you can purchase um, off the shelf or you can sit at your computer at home and be able to access it. That's why you would have to go either to a patent office or you would have to go to a PTRC. Um, Google Patents, obviously you could be sitting at, on your couch you know, with your own computer, you know, accessing Google Patents or SpaceNet or any of these other um, links that we have. All right, so um, if you are um, close to the Alexandria office, um, and when that does open, the uh, search room is open eight to five, Monday through Friday, non-federal uh, um, non holidays um, in this location and allows you again to have computer terminals that allow you to access that public east and west that the examiners use for conducting their searching, okay? Um, this is um, where the Patent and Trademark Resource Centers I talked about, PTRCs, all right? So, um, and there is a link that allows you to see where, who, who is, who's got, um, um, access to um, those computer terminals and where they're located. Um, and um, that, and uh, my understanding is, um, you know, Clemson University um, has a um, location that you can go, and this is what this is showing here up in Clemson, um, and uh, that you can go, and if you want to um, get access to that proprietary software of Public East, Public West. Um, at, the, at the patent offices, as well as these PTRCs, um, they do have personnel that can show you how to use um, the software so that you know how to get into and access that Public East and Public West software. Now, they can't provide you support on what keywords should I use, Cindy? 
you know, we can't provide that, but we can provide you the structure of how to go in and put in your queries so that you can come back with results. All right, so there's lots of steps as we talked about and we finished talking about, you know, is your invention patentable? All right, if you have questions on submitting a patent application um, uh, and, or general questions, um, you can always call, because right now you can't visit. So you can always call this number um, to be able to um, get your questions um, answered about you know, you know, how to submit my application or, or things like that. Again, they're, they're not gonna you know, provide you the guidance of what's my keyword should I use for umbrella? That's not gonna be the kind of information that they will be providing. That's the kind of information that a patent attorney could provide you. All right, and then um, if you wanna submit your application electronically, um, there is ability to do that. Again, if you've got um, a, a question, you can call or email based on how do I submit my patent application electronically versus you know, putting in, uh, in, you know, in snail mail and, and sending it off. Because again, dates gonna be important when you submit your patent application. So you may want to submit electronically so you can say, okay, I've got today is my date of when I'm submitting it versus putting it in the mail. And when they receive it or when it's stamped at the post office, that is the date that's going to be for your patent application date. All right. Um, are there any questions? Thank you, uh, Cynthia. Um, there was one question that I see coming up in the chat box. Um, uh, do you need a PTO badge in order to use the library in Alexandria? Um, no, not to use, you know, you don't need a badge. Um, and you don't even need a badge if you're going in, you know, when the Alexandria office does open, you don't need a badge, you'll come in as a guest. Um, and, um, but when you go into a library, um, no, you do not. You would just, you know, go to the uh, reference desk and, and ask where can I access, you know, the uh, um, patent office software and perhaps also ask um, who, you know, who in the staff knows how to use that software so they can provide you that guidance. So the other question that, that um, I have is in terms of uh, filing the patent, uh, you can still do it by mail. Uh, do you anticipate a time when it will need to be done electronically only? I haven't heard anything about the fact that you have to do it electronically. Um, and so no, I think it can still be done by putting it in the mail. Um, that's not a problem. Okay. Any, any other more. questions? I don't see any further questions coming in. All right. Um, my understanding is that this um, uh, presentation will be um, provided um, access um, for those who attended today. Um, is there anything else that anybody would like to say, whether it's you know, Doug or Eugene? Yeah, I've, I've, I've got some more to say. Um, okay. Yes, the, indeed, the, the presentation uh, has been recorded and the recording will be sent to all registrants. Um, there'll be a survey coming out. Please complete the survey and be on the lookout for other SCRA and um, Kim Law Firm sponsored webinars. Uh, those can be found on the SCRA website under news and events. Uh, some of the upcoming webinars include the five most common sales mistakes for small businesses. That'll be Thursday, July the 15th at 11 a.m. Um, another one in the patent series, part three, drafting a patent. That will be Wednesday, July the 21st at 11 a.m. We really thank uh, Cynthia for her expertise. It was great to hear all these methods of uh, properly preparing a search and the strategies that are necessary. And we thank you all for attending.